Well, hi, everyone. So uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce this uh, third Nobel lecture of uh, Yves Barry, so which uh, aims at becoming a kind of tradition here uh, um, in economics. So, um, so the goal is every year to ask the faculties who are the closest to this year Nobel Prize to just make an introductory lectures of uh, you know the contributions of the laureates and, and, and the topic. So, uh, it's, um, so this year we have uh, the pleasure to have Giovanni Rico, Olivier Loisel, and Julien Pratt who will be introducing the three uh, reci recipients of this year who are uh, Ben Bernanke, Douglas Diamond, and Philippe Dibouy for their contribution on banks and financial crisis. And so, uh, so the plan of the lecture, uh, the plan of the lecture is uh, Olivier Loisel will uh, start with an introduction, then Julien Pratt will uh, talk about why are banks fragile. Uh, Olivier Loisel will continue with why ba do banks exist, and uh, Giovanni will finish with what role did bank failures play in the Great uh, Depression. So, my pleasure to leave the floor to Olivier. Great, thanks. Thanks, Julien. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to make a very brief uh, introduction to the research of Bernanke, Diamond, and Divig. You know, the specific research for which they were awarded the, you know, the Bank of Sweden's uh, uh, prize in economic sciences in memory of uh, Alfred uh, Nobel. Uh, so how did you... Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start with a very basic fact. Uh, the first one being that non financial firms, and actually, this is even more true, of course, for uh, households, often borrow from a financial intermediary, which is typically a bank, so a depository uh, institution, a depository. Um, you know, financial intermediary, rather than borrowing directly uh, on uh, financial markets. So rather than issuing bonds uh, on the bond market or issuing equity on the stock market. And the second fact is that sometimes uh, banks fail. And when there is a large number of banks that fail, uh, you know, uh, at the same time, which is a situation I'm going to call a financial crisis, this is usually associated with a deep and long uh, recession. So you have so you know some graphs to illustrate these 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 facts here here is a a graph that shows you the sources of external funds for non-financial firms in, in four different countries uh, sorry uh you know the us germany japan and, and canada so the uh you know the boring of these non-financial firms that uh that uh, you know comes from banks or other financial institutions, you know, is the primary source of, uh, of external funds for these firms compared to direct financing on the financial markets. So here, bonds and, uh, and stocks. So just, you know, that banks in particular seems to play, uh, seem to play a, an important role in the financing of the economy. And the other fact is that, as I said, you know, banks sometimes fail uh here you've got the number of bank failures in the us over the course of about 150 years uh it's just a number it's not weighted by the size of banks which is unfortunate but it's despite that it's it's uh, it's telling and as you can see you know there is a, there are some periods in which you've got a large number of bank failures especially this period here in the uh, 1930s which corresponds to the great uh, depression. And indeed, when you look at uh, US GDP over the course of this, you know, the same 150 year period, this is the logarithm of US per capita, uh, per capita GDP. You, of course, you've got this, you know, trend, uh, upwards trend, uh, roughly 2% a year. 
but the, the most uh, uh, notable feature here is this big drop uh, followed by the rebound, which is precisely the Great Depression, during which uh, per capita GDP fell by about 30%. Uh, so, you know, at this period, many bank failures and a big recession, a depression, a depression action. So, uh, these facts raise, you know, some questions. Uh, why do banks exist in the first place? Could we do without banks? Why do they fail? And are bank failures costly for the economy? And why? Well, the 2022 prize was awarded to Bernanke, Diamond, Divig uh, for essentially three papers that did address these questions in the early 80s. You've got two uh, theoretical papers. Uh, one by Diamond and Divig, another by Diamond, uh, which developed, you know, models that seek to explain to explain why banks exist, why they fail, why their failure is costly. And you've got one empirical paper by Bernanke, uh, which uh, highlighted the role of bank failures in the Great Depression. Uh, okay, so these three papers basically, in a sense change the way uh, we as economists uh, think of banks and uh, bank failures. They had some important policy implications. Uh, the first of which is we should avoid bank failures uh, because of their cost for the economy. So that could be by providing deposit insurance, as we're going to see, could be by acting as the lender of uh, last resort, whatever. And of course, because you know, we should try to avoid bank failures. This is going to uh, give uh, banks possibly wrong incentives. So another implication is to regulate banks, uh, of course. Now, you may argue that the lesson of the Great Depression uh, and of, of these papers was learned in the sense that uh, when you look at uh, what is called the Great Recession, not the Great Depression, but Recession, which is, you know, the 2008 and 9 uh, recession here. As you can see, I mean, can you see? Yeah. As you can see, uh, this, this recession was much smaller in, in percent of GDP than, uh, than the Great Depression. Okay. And one likely reason for that is that uh, public authorities uh, did act as lenders uh, of last resort uh, during the Great Recession. Uh, okay. So, as uh, Julien said, the outline is going to be very simple. Uh, so we're going to, in a sense, talk about the three papers in turn, starting with Diamond and Divig. Uh, so the, the model basically of Diamond and Divig views banks as what I call here maturity transformers. So they have short-term liabilities, long-term assets, uh, which make them vulnerable to, to run. So the main question here is going to be why are banks fragile? Then we'll turn to Diamond's uh, paper uh, model, which, which use banks as delegated monitors. Then the question is going to be, why do they exist in the first place? And finally, to Bernanke's paper, uh, uh, which address, uh, addresses the, the, the question of what role did bank failures play in the Great uh, Depression? Uh, that's, that's it for the introduction. Uh, so, So I'm going to give the floor to Julien. Okay. So thanks a lot, Olivier. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending uh, this lecture. So I would like to start by uh, <coughs> clearing the air. As you may know, um, following his Nobel Prize, uh, Philip Dibdig has been uh, accused uh, of harassment by his former students. So it's a, <coughs> it's a serious matter. We, we do not take it lightly. However, uh, the investigation uh, is underway, so I'm not going to comment on it uh, further. In, okay. Um, I would just like to take this as an opportunity to say that uh, um, the Nobel Prize uh, is not the Oscars, okay? So we are not here to celebrate the personalities of uh, the recipients. We're going to talk about their idea. <clears throat> and uh, it's probably, you can cancel uh, an artist, you can probably cancel a scientist, but you cannot cancel his idea, especially when they are foundational. So <clears throat> whatever Philip Dibdig did, 
his idea will remain and it's important that you learn them and uh, will be always part of economic uh, yeah, of economics so um, if you don't have a question about this if you don't want to talk about it but i'm going to move on to the content of the talk and uh, so with that in mind what is the, con the scientific contribution of diamond and biblic so as uh, olivier said um yeah, we are going to talk about this foundational paper and it addresses three fundamental questions which are what is the function of banks when do bank runs happen and how can bank runs be prevented now of course uh the point of the paper is that these three questions are connected so if you start to understand i mean if you understand properly why bank exists then you will understand why bank runs happen and then you will also understand how you might prevent them but since this is a high level lecture, I thought I would start with a epistemological, no, epistemological is the word, digression, uh, comparing uh, what we do in economics to what we do, uh, to what people do in uh, engineering. So many of you are, have an engineering background among the students, about the faculty, can tell, yeah? About everyone, okay. How many of you have an engineering background? That's it. So you would not call me and say, okay, okay. So I thought I would have more engineers in the room. Now, what you do when you do engineering, <clears throat> you learn how to do new things. And in some ways, I think you envision the future. You make the impossible possible. But uh, economics in some respect is closer to philosophy, not always, but at least this paper is. So <clears throat> to uh, substantiate this claim, I put this, uh, maybe I should take out this phrase. I put this uh, famous quote by Hegel. I don't know if you're familiar by that, with it, sorry. So the, the quote goes as follows. Philosophy as the thought of the world does not appear until reality has completely completed its formative process and made itself reality, really. Sorry, I'm butchering it, sorry. The all of Minerva takes its flight only when the shades of night are gathering. Almost, almost poetry. So do, do you see what, do you understand what it means? Or not really. So what Hegel meant here is that philosophy might look boring because it doesn't invent anything, any new thing. It just it just makes sense of the world how it how the world is already, and because you can only get philosophical insights where things are fully formed. Okay, and in that sense, it's like the old that takes out in the night when things have already happened. Right. Okay, and. In that sense, the paper by uh, Diamond Divig is similar because it's going to explain things that already exist. So banks exist, bank run exists, and the regulation is going to, the paper shows that what has been done to prevent bank run is actually optimal. So it's not going to invent anything new, but it's making sense of reality as we observe it. And the, and the idea is that by doing so, you make it more transparent and more, and yes, okay, you have a better understanding of the, what around you and the society you, you live in. And uh, in many ways, that's what we do in economics. And uh, might be, I think it's surprising maybe when you come from an engineering background where you want to maybe create new things, change the world. In here, this is not a paper about changing the world, it's a paper about making the world less opaque. Now, let me get, so if you remember, the first question is, what is the function of banks? So I'm going to ask you, what do you think is the function of banks? And you should not be too shy. So some of you have an idea. Why, why do you think banks exist? What do they do? I'm too shy to, to speak out. So it's such a basic question, right? We are surrounded by banks. You're studying economics, and you have no, you don't have like a, a feeling of why banks exist you don't have <laughs> it's not a micro question actually i think it's more a micro question it's just more a micro paper in the end so right right that's going to be the function and uh what so it transforms savings into investment and what does it entail when you do that so that's true that the process and what is the implication of that process yeah it, it can add it in here 
yes, it helps you to sell value through time, but you could do that with gold, I guess, to some extent. No. But you're right. I mean, it's true. Yeah. Yes. So that's that's what is stressed is highlighted in that paper so banks have several functions but that's the one we will focus on in that talk which is maturity transformation so if you think about it when you put money at the bank not always but most of the time at least deposits are liquid you can withdraw your money whenever you want however the banks they lend that money maybe like if you want to buy your house and then it's become much less liquid or they invest in a long-term project so they take some investment so you put money at the bank it remains liquid but the bank put it into investment which have a longer horizon and this is going to create naturally a tension okay and that uh, this function that um, that is stressed out in a um, diamond when you give paper now I, I was not completely sure if i can do a model so i think i can now because most of you have an economic background so i'm going to just highlight the structure of the model of course but uh, it's a very simple model, actually, and it's a very simple paper. It's, it's not, I mean, the writing is a bit opaque because it's very technical, but in the end, it's a simple paper. Um, so you have two types of depositors. So you have early and late withdrawers. Now, actually, it's not really two types. At the beginning of time, these, oops, these guys they are the same in dead zero. They don't know whether they're going to be early or late. Okay, so they start. But what can happen is that in that one, they need their money. So if they need their money, they're going to be early withdrawers. Okay, why do they need their money? I mean, I mean, maybe they have a preference shock or they get sick or they learn that they're going to die and uh, they want to consume, whatever. Okay, so they, they are unlucky. They need their money. But if they are not unlucky, they're going to be late withdrawers and only withdraw their savings in period two. Okay, now the bank has two types of assets, short short asset that brings no return okay it's written here okay they have no return they uh, yes they have no return in period one so if you put the money it's a deposit you put the money you come in period in period zero you deposit your money you come in period one you get the money but you don't get any interest on it. however if you are patient you can invest in the long run asset which has a positive return r which is period one okay why? Because it has been invested in a productive uh, investment. I don't know, build a house, build a car, build a factory, whatever. Okay. Now, the other thing that is important is that in period one, a share omega of the depositors learn that they need the money. So they learn that their type is actually early in the sense that they need the money right now. Okay. So they, in period zero, they were hoping to put their money in the bank and take it in period two, maybe let's say for retirement, but in period one, they learned that they will never be able to use it for retirement because they need it right now, okay? And it's, and it's a bad deal because they, of course, they're gonna get a lower return. Now, uh, okay, so very quickly, you have a utility function, C1, C2, period one, period two. Here, it's gone. in the paper, it's just uh, linear in C1 plus C2. But if you are typed early, you don't care about your consumption in period two. That's the key thing. You only care about your consumption. Let's say maybe because you die. Okay, you learn that you're gonna die and you need the money to make it uh, okay. very simple. Now, um, what is your optimal? Uh, if you were in autarky, so if there were no banks, okay, yet you will be on your own. What will be your utility? The expectation of your utility. So, with priority omega, you are early type, and you're gonna consume everything, and you get one. And with priority one minus omega, you're gonna be a late type. So, and then you're going to get R. Okay. That's clear. Very simple. Huh? Now, if, okay, so that's, that's what you get if you were on your own. Now, imagine you have a planner where you could report your type. Now, what the planner is going to do is going to do an allocation. It's going to give C1E to the early type, so E for early. And then it's going to give C1L plus C2L to the late type. Well, you can show that C1L is zero by the linearity. And, uh, so that's the problem of the planner. So the planner now is offering a contract. The contract is if you come in period one, I'm going to give you C1E. If you come in period two, I'm going to give you C2L. He's facing a budget constraint. So what is the budget constraint? So 
one minus omega c two l is how much the planner is going to give, right? Because one minus omega is the share of long uh, lead types times their consumption, and this has to be inferior to resources. So what are resources? If nobody had withdrawn in period one, it would be R. Okay, we assume that there is a mass of one. Okay, so the, you can normalize to one the size of the population, but you have a share omega of the population that has withdrawn in period one. Okay, and you have given them C one E. So you have to subtract that, right? And that's your budget constraint. Now I'm going to jump. Okay, so then it's, I mean, it's, it's trivial. Huh? <laughs> so uh, you solve this problem. Okay, so I put up to highlight the fact that the planner in this scenario is able to observe the type of the agent. So they report their type and the planner can tell, are ah, you ready early or you're late? You cannot cheat. Okay. So let's say, uh, okay, maybe, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. Okay, you cannot observe the type. So then you get this optimality condition, okay, that the marginality of consumption in period one has to be equal to marginality of consumption in period two times the rate of return. Which repeated here. Now, if you compare with autarky, okay, there is a, a step, a mathematical step. It's not obvious, it's not trivial, but I mean, it's almost trivial. <laughs> it's a one line of algebra. You can show that the marginal utility of consumption in autarky in period one is superior to the marginality of consumption of autarky in period two times the rate of return. Okay. And this is true only when the agent's relative risk aversion is higher than one. So if you are ready to make this assumption, you're going to get this inequality. Now, why is this inequality interesting? Because it means that because the marginal utility is decreasing, right? It, get, it implies that the optimal consumption of the planner in period one is higher than the one under autarky. And the consumption in period two of the planner is lower than the one in autarky. So, in other words, the planner smooths the consumption of the agent. Maybe it's, I think it's more easy to find faster to explain with a graph. The blue crosses are the, is the allocation on the autarky. So that's what you will get if you didn't have access to, uh, if the planner was not involved. So in, if you withdraw in period one, you get one. And if you withdraw in period two, you get R. Ah, it's trivial, right? It's just a return of the asset. That's all you can do. Now, the planner comes in, and what it does is that it gives you a bit more in period one and a bit less in period two. And do you see why? I mean, this should, like, do you see why it does that? The planner? Why is it optimal to do that? Yes, exactly. So your risk averse. In period zero, if you knew in period zero, by the way, if you knew in period zero whether you were going to be type one or type two, things would be very different. Here, what matters is that in period zero, you have no idea. So you're facing a consumption profile. Well, if you are unlucky, you are very unlucky. And if you are lucky, you are very lucky. But uh, actually, it's always better. That's why we have insurance companies that you want to smooth your profile. No, if you are in the event that you are unlucky, you, you know, you get a little bit of compensation and then uh, okay if you are lucky you get less and why is it worth it because the marginal utility of consumption in period two is lower than period one so it's a good deal ex ante right typical uh, insurance motive and so you get this contract and that's what we should do that's what the planner is going to do it's basically a risk sharing allocation now the question that comes is okay i have not yet talked about banks no there's no bank in that model there was like agents and a planner so now, what, what, what do you think is going to be the next question? Nice to have faculty here. <laughs> when you give a talk, right? you can speak also the student. I mean, that's, yeah, okay, don't be shy. But exactly, so now we have this thing. So we have this like optimal allocation. Can we implement it? And the answer is yes. Uh, um, you can implement it. I think it was maybe in the previous slide. Banks can implement it, no? And why can they implement it? Because it's incentive compatible. Because you don't have the incentive to report as type one when you are really type two, because it's worth waiting. So there's no problem. Okay, you could say, okay, this planner allocation, but the bank can do it. And the answer is yes, they can do it, but there is a problem. And uh, okay, okay, I'm gonna ask it. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's too interactive or maybe. Uh, so what do you think can be the problem? So I said banks can do it. 
So, I mean, we could wrap up the paper and, and go home. I mean, it's fine. I mean, there's no, that's it, okay. Uh, banks are just great because they implement the first best and uh, we are happy, but there's a little problem. Exactly, so they can do it. It's a Nash equilibrium of the game because it's incentive compatible. It's a good equilibrium, but there is another equilibrium. There are two equilibria. There's a good one where banks do what the planner wants to do, and there's a bad one where uh, the agent panics. And uh, what happens is that if they start to panic and they all want to withdraw in period one, actually, it's a good idea to run and get the money in period one. And that's a bad equilibria. Now, this bad equilibria arises because if you look at the financial system, there is, I mean, it's a design of thing, is what's called the sequential service constraint, is that if you go to the bank and if you form a queue and you want to withdraw your deposit, the bank is going to serve people as they come. First come, first serve. Right? That's how it works. And so um, what happened is that, remember, the allocation that the bank should implement, they should promise more consumption in period one than what is produced actually in period one. So if everybody wants to withdraw in period one, there is clearly not enough money in the bank. Okay, so if everybody anticipates that the other is going to do it, and given that it depends on your position in the line, okay, then it's rational to start panicking and go in the line and withdraw your money, even though you're a type two and you don't really need the money, but you know that if you don't queue, you're gonna get nothing. And that's a bad equilibrium, okay? It's, is it clear? So this is what I written there because C1 star is higher than one. If let types withdraw in period one because they think they are panicking, the bank becomes illiquid and it has to liquidate the, the assets. And so there will be nothing left in period two, okay? And then the belief in a bank run is self-fulfilling because the best response of lead type is indeed to get in line. Now, the possibility of a run arises from the fact that the bank has illiquid assets for what it has invested in for period two, but it has liquid liabilities that can be redeemed freely in the first period. Okay. And so now we have seen that the nature of banks, which is to transform uh, maturities, in itself has also a curse. So it has a function, but a curse with, because it's sustained by nature, bank runs. Yes. So I don't think I don't think the planner do that because here at, at least I mean you could think of it this way, but I don't think that the way Diamond and Dilding think about it because they, they assume observability, so you don't need to commit to anything. You can show up in period one, but I will be able to see whether you really need the money in period one. So basically, you're gonna die, and you have to show me that you have terminal cancer. So here, yeah, I don't think you need to commit because it's that's clearly specified in the paper. It's under observability. Ah, but you don't. Yeah, 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 you're right. If you don't, but that's why I'm insisting on that because that's how they write the paper. Okay, you're right. I mean, if you don't observe, it's not true. So then there is a point of incentive compatibility that comes after, right? But that's not the way they think about it. So they don't think about a contract. They think just about the ability of the planner to observe type. I think basically they don't want to get into that debate. Um, um, so a run is a liquidity crisis. And that's what is really interesting is the bank has the money. If nobody panics, everything is going to be fine. No, if nobody runs for the exit, the money is there, just wait for period two. But uh, it's still nonetheless, uh, so it's solvent, but it's nonetheless bankrupt because everybody wants to withdraw their fund now because they expect the other to do it. And indeed, if the other do it, it's what you should do. Okay, it's, it's a very it's a social phenomenon. It's, very con con counterintuitive. Now, if you have a solvency crisis, then it's zero, so then it's really bad because here the bank really lacks the fund. But the point of the paper is to say that we can have liquidity crisis. So the fundamentals are good, and nonetheless you have a big financial crisis. Okay, so maybe 
don't know, well, maybe what happened uh, in Italy uh, during uh, 2009 when there was a run on the sites a bit different. But yeah, you can think of it that way. Really. So now, what would you do? So what can you, how can you solve that? So now we need a bit more. So okay, we have the bank. So how would you stop, prevent this bad equilibrium from happening? So remember, it, this equilibrium arises because you have this sequential service constraint. So what could you do? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so exactly. So you, you just um, unplug it. And you say, okay, you know what? We're going to suspend payments. That's what they did in Cyprus at some point, if I remember correctly, or also at some point also in England in 2009. So you say, if you come to the bank, I mean, we're not going to give you the money. So of course, I mean, uh, people don't want to do it because it triggers a crisis. People got start to freak out. But you say, in the model, you say that uh, there is a share omega of early type. So if you have more than omega withdrawing in the first period, you stop paying people. Now you're going to say, but this, people are going to panic, but okay, but still the money is going to stay in the bank. And actually, if you are a late type, then if you see that the policy, the best response is not to run. Why? Because if they try to withdraw, they will either get C1 E star or they will have to wait for C2 L star because the bank is not going to go down now because they have stopped paying. The bank will stay solvent. But they prefer to have C2 L star because they are late type. So they're not going to run. The key point is that by stopping withdrawing, uh, suspending payments, sorry, you stop the bank from going bankrupt. And I'm, as a late type, that's all I care about because I don't need the money right now. So if I'm confident that the bank will survive, I will wait. So the bank run is not anymore an Nash equilibrium and commitment acts as a, this commitment to suspend payments acts as a coordination device. Now, what is the problem with that? Potentially, yes. So if you know Omega, for sure it's fine, but the world is definitely not like that, right? And if you suspend at Omega, and actually some guys really need the money, you're not going to fulfill your function as a for these guys, okay? Because actually they don't care in period two, so this guy will really get zero. So you have a problem uh, as soon as omega is not known with certainty, which is obviously the truth. And as soon as you cannot observe, if you could observe types, okay, it's no problem. But if you don't know how many people are early and you cannot observe their type, then by suspending payment, you're going to um, sacrifice them, if I may say, right? And here comes the idea that the Banks should not do that. They should not suspend payment. There is also issue of inducing panic when you do that, honestly, because when people know that payment, okay, well, it's clear what happens. You don't have to draw a picture. But uh, the idea is that the government can do it, and, and only the government can do it, because why? Because the government has the power to tax. And the idea is the following, is that imagine that, okay, many people run, okay? So you let them run, okay? You let them withdraw. They deplete the bank, but what you're going to do is that you're going to tax them and you're going to use the receipt from the tax to refinance the bank. And so the power of the government that the private actor don't have is that the government can act exposed, okay, by taking money from withdrawers. And there is nothing that the withdrawer can do about it because they are, they are submitted to the taxation power of the government. So this ability to react exposed gives a special power to the government and it explains why it's the government that has deposit insurance and not financial and not private institutions. Is that clear? You have questions about this? So um, to, re to, to, to repeat what I just said, because they know that they will, the lead type knows that the early withdrawal will be taxed. They also know that they will receive their transfer C to L star because the bank will be refinanced, and hence the late type will not panic. You don't, we will not get a bank run, and this special power of the government arises because it does not face the constraints on reserves that impede private institution. And the final answer. So this answers the final question of why 
deposit insurance is backed by the government and not by private institutions because they don't have this special power. Yeah, that's uh, so I don't know, I have, I have like five minutes or not, or no idea, or I can leave this. So I have what, two minutes? Two? Okay. Because, uh, okay. Uh, because, okay, so this I give in, you give in my class, no, but I'm going to do it in two, don't worry. Uh, if I keep going like this, uh, it's not going <laughs> to. But uh, so one example, so recently there was a bank run. So, I, okay, I teach a class on crypto and, and I thought it was funny because uh, we had a bank run. Uh, we had few bank runs on, in crypto recently, big one. So Luna, 40 billion disappeared in two days. And uh, I think FTX is also 50 billion that disappeared in a couple of, in a, in a day. Okay. So, um, so really example of bank run. So the story was they launched a fund. So I'm going to uh, skip it. But like in November 2, there was a leak that some money was not there in the account. And uh, Binance said, okay, uh, I withdraw my money. And then as soon as Binance did that, uh, but the run happened. And so from November 6 to November 12, um, everything, all the funds disappeared. Okay. And FTX was wiped out. Okay. And uh, so it's really a run. It's definitely a run. Uh, now, the funny thing is that, okay, that's a joke, but uh, that's the balance sheet that was sent by. Uh, so they asked, so the, the, the regulator asked, what money do you have? And that's the answer from FTX. And I'm not kidding. That's what they sent back for a, a balance sheet of like 20 billion. So the guy has like three Excel. So <laughs> that's what he sent. And okay, so then when people saw that, they saw that it's really a problem because that's their, their the book of the company. Okay. And there is a sentence there are many things I wish I could do differently than I did. But the largest are represented by these two things, the poorly labeled internal bank related account and the size of customer withdrawals during a run on the bank. So if he had run Diamond and DB, he would have known that they will withdraw everything because at the point of the model, when you have a run, people withdraw everything. There is no size of withdrawal, it's everything or nothing. But okay, he's not an economist, he's a computer scientist. But okay, it's a joke, but so I'm just, Okay, so, but I think it's interesting for two things because it's not. So, do you think it's a liquidity crisis or a solvency crisis in that case? I think it's okay, but I, I'm going to take a plunge. I think it's a solvency crisis. I think it's not a good example of the diamond and DIVIC models. They clearly stole the money and the money was not there. So, it's not exactly like the model we've seen because this guy had really the money had evaporated. And it's not what the the diamond diving model says something different. It says, even when the money is there, you may have a panic, which is very strong. No? I mean, like, think about it. Like, there's no fundamental problem, but it's still fragile by, by, by itself. Here, it was fragile because they were just a bunch of proof and they took everything. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm registered, but okay. I think it's okay. And uh, I think now it's consensual. And, uh, and, uh, but there is another thing where it's related to the diamond diving model is there is no regulation. And the state was not standing behind. So here, the crypto is completely outside of the realm of the, of the regulation. The state is not standing behind. And we see that when you don't have the state behind, uh, bank runs are a very common phenomenon. And why do I insist on that? Because if you look in, a, in the financial sector in, in Europe or in the US, they are pretty rare. They happened in 2009. But it's, I mean, your generation, my generation, we have not seen many bank runs. It's kind of uncommon. But you look at crypto outside, so that's the message of, the, of Diamond Divic. You know, the state is the regulator, the natural regulator. They are outside uh, the regulation of the state. So we have a, also a solvency crisis, but overall, we see bank runs left and right because, okay, the natural regulator for banks and financial institutions is the state and not private actors. Okay, so that was uh, my message. Thank you.
Okay, uh, well, thanks, uh, Julien. So I'm going to turn to the second paper uh, we you know, mentioned, uh, so Diamond's uh, paper, uh, which addresses the question of why do banks exist, which is also a question that was addressed in the first paper. Uh, but on top of that, the first paper you know, uh, had the question, uh, addressed the question of why they are uh, fragile. Here, uh, the, the model, you know, developed by Diamond uh, is going to view banks as delegated monitors. And I'm going to be, of course, a bit clearer about what that means in a, in a, in a short moment. Uh, yeah, so, so, you know, put differently and reformulated by Diamond a few years later, the question is why do investors first lend to banks who then lend to borrowers instead of lending directly to borrowers. So the paper you know, develops a theory of financial intermediation, which is based on asymmetric information and incentive problems between borrowers and uh, investors. Uh, uh, in this theory, investors are going to delegate the monitoring of borrowers to a financial intermediary, you know, hence the the uh, delegated monitor um, uh, stuff in my, in my previous slide, and uh, the diversification across loans within the intermediary is going to solve the incentive problems of the intermediary. And the theory is going to predict the existence of intermediaries, financial intermediaries, that look very much like banks. Uh, banks, you know, that uh, whose liabilities are deposits from the general public, uh, in the sense that uh, these financial intermediaries whose existence is predicted by the, by the model are large and well diversified. And this is going to occur in the model, even uh, though all agents in the model are, are risk neutral. They have debt liabilities, so you, which you may call deposits, just like the deposits of a bank, with costly bankruptcy. And they have illiquid assets, illiquid loans. Okay, so that's the main predictions of of the uh, of the model. So I'm going to well first, you know, what's the setup of the model? It's going to be a very simple model, just like the previous one as well. Uh, in this model, you have firms, you have investors, and you have a bank. Uh, you've got n firms. Uh, which uh, uh, each of them has zero wealth, and each of them has a project uh, that needs some investment uh, to be, you know, started. Investment normalized to one. So firms cannot, you know, do them by themselves in the sense that they need to borrow to get the funds to uh, to uh, conduct these uh, these projects. On the other hand, you have m times n investors, each will with wealth one over m. M being higher than one, so one over M is lower than one. So the total wealth of investors is exactly what's needed to finance the N projects of the N firms. There is also one bank uh, with zero wealth that may play a role in equilibrium or not. Uh, all these agents are risk neutral, as I said. And uh, finally, investors, they have an outside option, uh, which uh, give them the return capital R uh, for sure, okay? So when they uh, lend to uh, an agent, another agent in this model, they require an expected return of at least capital R, right? Now, what about the projects of the firms? So each firm has a one project and the return of this project, let's call it Y for a given firm, it is exogenous and stochastic in this model. Uh, the probability distribution of, the, of this return uh, is common knowledge. So everyone knows this probability distribution, the bank and the investors as well. The lowest possible realization of the return, Y, of the project is zero. Okay, that's a possibility included in the distribution. The firm, of course, observes the realization of the return of the project of its own project, but the investors and the bank do not. At least do not costlessly observe this return. The realization of this return can observe it only by paying a monitoring, monitoring cost capital K, which is the same 
you know, for the investors and the bank. So we're not going to explain the, the existence of banks by assuming that they have better monitoring skills than investors. So in this context, the basic question is how can firms get funds from investors? And in principle, you know, that could be either directly or indirectly. So directly, you know, investors lending directly to firms. Indirectly, that means investors lending to a bank and the bank lending to firms. And on top of that, it can be with monitoring of firms or without monitoring of firms. Now, without monitoring of firms, uh, there is going to be a moral hazard problem here. Why? Because each firm is going to be, uh, you know, it's, without monitoring, this, only the firm can observe the return, the realized return of the project. So each firm has an incentive to pretend that the realized return is zero, and then we pay nothing to investors or to the bank. In which case, you know, why would the investors or the bank lend to the firms in the first place? Well, we're going to see that there is uh, actually uh, an equilibrium with, uh, with, uh, without monetary. In fact, in the model, there, there are going to be three possibilities in equilibrium. Uh, first, direct finance, so without any bank. Direct finance without monitoring. Second, direct finance with monitoring. And third, indirect finance that, you know, goes through a bank. In which case, uh, there in, in this indirect finance case, there will be, you know, the bank is going to monitor the firms, but the, the investors are not going to monitor the bank. Okay, you could think of other possibilities in which the investors monitor the bank, which in turn monitors the firms. It's not going to be possible in equilibrium. It's going to be dominated by this kind of in indirect finance uh, here in the world. So I'm going to go through each of these possibilities in turn. Okay, starting with direct finance without monitoring. Uh, first of all, uh, a graph uh, illustrating direct finance, which I borrowed directly from uh, Diamonds uh, last year. Uh, so here you've got, the, you know, direct finance means zero bank. Investors lend directly to uh, firms. Indirect finance, investors lend to the bank. In turn, the bank lends to firms. Okay. Uh, okay. So as I said, I'm, you know, uh, considering each of the three possibilities in turn, starting with direct finance without monetary. And I'm going to start with a simplest case in which you've got only one firm and one investor. Uh, N is equal to N is equal to one. Uh, and the question, as you remember, uh, hopefully, is how can the firm convince the investor to invest uh, despite the moral hazard uh, problem that we have? So we're without monitoring. So without monitoring, that means that the uh, only variable that is observed by the investor who lends directly to the firm is the repayment made by the firm to him or her. Okay, so repayment Z. Z, of course, the, the amount of, uh, you know, uh, the amount repaid by the firm is going to be between zero and Y, Y being the realized return of the project uh, run by the, by the firm. And you know it's the firm who chooses that chooses this this repayment. So the financial contract between the firm and the investor can only depend on this observed uh, variable. Uh, so how do you you know solve this moral hazard problem I was talking about? Well, the key insight here in the paper is that you allow for financial contracts with a non-pecuniary penalty. Let's call it phi of Z, Z is the repayment, which is incurred by the firm, but not enjoyed by the investor. And here I'm quoting uh, Diamond, uh, the paper, for the interpretation uh, of, the, of the penalty. Uh, in equilibrium, off equilibrium, it's, it's not very clear to me, but in equilibrium, it's very clear the interpretation is going to be bankruptcy penalties. Uh, that includes you know, a manager's time spent in bankruptcy proceedings, 
costly explaining of poor results, search costs of a fired manager, loss of reputation, and blah, blah, blah. And the good news is that physical punishment is a less realistic example. Okay, so these are, you know, costs that are incurred, penalty that, that is incurred by the firm, but not by, uh, not enjoyed by the uh, investor. And of course, you, you should expect this function here to be uh, decreasing in Z. So the smaller the amount uh, repaid by the firm, the higher the penalty uh, incurred by the firm. So now the problem of the firm, the firm wants to be funded by the investor. The problem of the firm is going to choose the penalty function phi here. Uh, uh, that is going to be, you know, in the financial contract that that it uh, that the firm is going to propose to the investor. So that's the optimization problem of the firm. The firm chooses the penalty function phi, okay, to maximize expected profits. What are profits? Well, the firm receives, you know, the return of the project, which is y here. And then the firm pays the repays the, the investor. It repays Z, so Y minus Z. And then the firm incurs uh, the penalty, the non-pecuniary penalty fee uh, phi of, of Z. And of course, the firm, you know, wants the return is realized, the firm chooses the repayment Z to maximize this profit. Okay. And in the first uh, place, you know, before the realization of the return uh, and to write the financial contract, it, it chooses this penalty function. This is, of course, subject to the participation constraint of the investor, uh, which is that on average, the investor should, re should get at least you know, this capital R. So on average, this is the expectation of, and inside the curve bracket, it looks very complicated, but this is just the repayment chosen by the firm. Okay, so this is the repayment Z that maximizes the profit of the firm. Okay, so in expectation, this repayment should be at least capital R. That's the participation constraint of uh, the investor. Now, I'm going to describe the solution of this optimization problem uh, without formally proving it, that's in the paper. And, and after that, I'm going to interpret this solution. So the solution is, you know, that the firm is going to choose a penalty function phi star of Z. That is the maximum of H minus Z here and zero. So H is going to be a threshold, a constant that is defined, you know, by implicitly by this equation below. Uh, but so in a sense, the penalty is that if the firm repay more than this threshold H, well, it incurs no penalty. If the firm repays less than this threshold H, it does incur a penalty. And the size of this penalty is the, the, the shortfall of Z from uh, the threshold uh, H. And with this contract, the investor is going to receive a repayment Z, which is equal to H, the threshold. When the realized return y is above h. Okay, so in that case, the investor receives h and the firm keeps y minus h. Uh, and the repayment received by the investor is going to be y when y, the realized return, is below h. Okay, so in which case the, uh, the, the investor received everything that the, the, that the firm got. On average, uh, the expected uh, repayment received by the investor is capital R. And actually this equation here is nothing else than, you know, the fact that on average, the repayment is capital R just for the participation constraint of the investor to be satisfied. So when you think of that, this contract chosen by the firm, optimally chosen by the firm and proposed to the investor is a debt contract in the sense that the investor just asks the firm to make a fixed repayment, which is H, the threshold, okay? And in case the firm does, you know, repay, repays less than this fixed amount, which you can interpret as a default, partial or total default, then the investor 
forecloses the firm and gets everything that the firm has, which is which is uh, which is one. Okay. No, so now let's. I mean, how comes that we have this uh, optimal contract? Uh, let's interpret that. So, as I said, the penalty, you know, is the is equal to the shortfall from the uh, of the repayment from the threshold edge. Well, when the realized return y is above the threshold, the penalty function chosen by the firm phi star makes the firm indifferent between repaying h and incurring no penalty at all, or repaying less than h, but then you know incurring a penalty. And if the firm is indifferent between these two options, you know we assume the paper assumes that uh, it's going to choose the first option, which is repay h. Right? Again, because the penalty chosen, the penalty function is a shortfall from h. When the realized return y is below the threshold h, the penalty function phi star chosen by the firm makes the firm indifferent between repaying y, which is you know everything the firm has, and incurring a certain penalty because y is below h, or repaying less than y uh, and incurring a larger penalty, right? The bank is the firm is indifferent, so by assumption we assume it, it, it chooses the first option, which is repaying y. So that's a debt contract uh, with costly bankruptcy for uh, the firm. Uh, and this was, you know, we, we talked about the simplest case in which there is only one firm, one uh, investor. But of course, when you generalize that to several, uh, several uh, firms and several or several investors, you're going to have an optimal financial contract, which is going to look very much like this one in the sense that each investor is going to lend one over M and each firm is going to incur a penalty of phi star of ZJ over M on the basis of payment ZJ to investor J. So it's the same function phi star. Okay, so that's a way, you know, by allowing financial contracts with a non-pecuniary penalty, that's the way you can solve the moral uh, hazard problem I was mentioning. That's the first out of three possibilities, you know, uh, for the firms to get funded, direct finance without monetary. Let's turn to the second one, direct finance with monetary. And the paper assumes that uh, each investor has to pay the monetary cost before receiving the firm's payment. Otherwise, it, the game would be different. The results will be different. Uh, so the paper focuses on this, on this case. And each investor does not observe the firm's repayments to the other investors. So you cannot learn from you know, observing other payments. Then in this case, no monetary—I mean, no monitoring—is going to be preferred to monitoring if and only if this inequality is, is satisfied. So, on the right-hand side here, you've got the cost, the total cost of monitoring the firm. Each investor, and there are m investors, each investor monitors the firm, right? And the cost of monitoring is k. So the total cost of monitoring is MK. This is, you know, uh, a cost that investors are going to pass on to the firm. So uh, the firm incurs these total costs when uh, choosing direct finance with monitoring. The left-hand side here is the cost also, you know, incurred by the firm uh, for direct finance without monitoring. This is exactly, you know, the expected uh, penalty uh, incurred by the firm that we saw uh, earlier. Okay, that's the cost for the firm to uh, to choose direct finance without monitoring. So, of course, if the cost uh, with monitoring is is higher than the cost without, then uh, no monitoring is preferred. And in particular, if you have a large number of investors per firm, M here. Is large, then you will uh, you will prefer no monitoring uh, to uh, to monitoring. That's just a 
an argument about economies of uh, scale. Yeah. So by the firm which proposes the contract, but the other ones are going to be indifferent in the sense that anyway, the investors are going to, to get R in expectation uh, in both cases. So they're indifferent, but the firm does strictly prefer So I think that, I don't think it's an assumption. I mean, provided that you assume that there is no observation of the firm's payments to the other investors by each investor. I think that if you load for asymmetric equilibria, you will not find any. Yeah, the reason, so the question is why is the monitoring cost multiplied by M? Because precisely because of the assumption here above, which is that each investor has to monitor the firm. Each investor does not observe the repayment made by, uh, by uh, the firm to the other investors. So you cannot you know, delegate the monitoring cost to only one investor and then trust this investor that is going to say, look, uh, it's okay, I've monitored the firm, believe me, and so on. Uh, so that's why, that's why it's multiplied by M, and that's indeed also one reason why banks are going to be uh, potentially preferred to uh, direct finance with monetary. Yeah, but that is going to look like the, well, I mean, like the inter indirect finance uh, case in which the bank itself is the only one to monitor the, the borrower. So, I mean, you'll tell me, but I think it's, it looks like the, the third possibility, which is indirect finance. And in this model, I mean, you could think of the different ways to have the indirect finance, so with, without monitoring at this step, at that step. But uh, the only, the one that dominates the others is the one in which, you know, you've got the bank between uh, uh, investors and the firms, and the bank is going to monitor the firms while the investors are not going to monitor the bank. Uh, we make similar assumptions, you know, to uh, the previous assumptions. The bank pays the monitoring costs before receiving the firm's payments, each investor does not observe the bank's payments to the other investors. What's going to happen is that, you know, between the bank and investors, there is no monitoring. Well, the bank is going to propose exactly the same kind of financial contract to the investors as, you know, the financial contract proposed by the firm to investors in the previous case of direct finance, okay? Uh, so it's going to propose debt contracts with costly bankruptcy to investors, and that's going to solve the bank's incentive problem. And that's going to explain why in this model, investors are depositors. They are the deposit, they make deposits to the bank, debt contracts. Okay, so you know, it's just very similar to what we had before. The bank receives a, a stochastic amount of revenues from the firms and uh, repays capital ZN to uh, the investors. And the financial contract is going to uh, involve this penalty function here, capital phi star, which is very similar to the one we had before, uh, where ZN is the total payment uh, of the bank to uh, depositors and the threshold capital HN. So subscript N, because I want to emphasize the fact that this is going to depend on the number of firms financed by the bank. Uh, the threshold HN is such that on average, the repayment is an R to the N investors. Okay. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's 
you save the cost. You save you save on the monitoring cost, but you incur an, another a new cost, which is the uh, cost of the debt contract between the bank and investors. So now you have three possibilities: direct finance uh, without monitoring. Remember the cost of which is the expected penalty paid by the firm per firm. Uh, the second solution uh, possibility is uh, direct finance with monitoring, whose cost is MK. And the third possibility is delegated monitoring, the indirect finance, uh, whose cost is uh, the left hand side here of this inequality. So, of course, if it is lower than the minimum of the other two costs, then delegated monitoring is preferred in the sense that in equilibrium you have banks. You have indirect finance. So what is this cost? This cost is the sum of two terms, the monitoring cost, because the bank has to monitor the firms. So it's a cost per firm here that I'm writing. OK, so pays the bank pays K uh, to monitor each firm. But on top of that, the bank you know, uh, incurs a non-pecuniary penalty uh, in case it fails uh, to, to, for, for it to have the right incentives to repay depositors, to repay yeah, investors, depositors. And per firm, this cost is uh, the expected penalty paid by the bank divided by M. Okay, now the key thing is that uh, the bank finances here several projects and firms. Okay, now you have to, so, so far I've, I've not talked about the possible correlation between the returns of the different projects here. Uh, if these returns are IID, so uncorrelated across firms, uh, what's going to happen is that the, what the amount received by the bank as the number of firms it finances you know, increases and goes to infinity, this amount, this average amount is going to its variance is going to go to go to zero. Okay, so that's the law of large numbers. Uh, the variance of the average repayment of firms to the bank is going to uh, go to zero when again when project returns are IID, and therefore you know uh, the bank asymptotically as n if you think of n going to infinity. The bank faces no uncertainty about that. Uh, this is, of course, understood by uh, investors. But if there is no uncertainty about how much the bank gets from firms, of course, there is no more incentive problem for the firm to you know, pretend that the amount was very low and so on. So that solves the incentive problem of the bank. I mean, to have a large number of firms whose projects returns are IID. Uh, and that makes Delegated monitoring, so the existence of bank uh, be de equilibrium being preferred if the number of firms per bank is sufficiently large. This is, you know, just the prince. I mean, the, the, the argument is that the risk is diversified. But remember that we are in a model in which every agent is risk neutral. Diversification does matter, even though everyone is risk neutral. So, what matters is diversification within the bank not across banks for a given investor. And why does it matter? It matters because it helps to provide the right incentives to the bank. So that's in the case in which you know, project returns are IID. Uh, the paper also considers the case in which uh, they are not IID, but they, also, they depend also on some common factors that are observable exposed, like macro variables. And the paper shows that the results still hold in the sense that what matters for the bank's incentives is the, the non-observable IID component of the uh, returns, not the, not the other components, OK? All right, so, oh yeah, so that's the, uh, I mean, this is just a graph to illustrate coming from the document that accompanied, um, you know, the, uh, the publication of the of the laureates and so on by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences that illustrate the law of large numbers. Okay, so you just you know you have different losses uh, from your loans, but on average, you know you're going to uh, 
to have uh, something less uncertain if, if the number of, of uh, projects you fund is, is sufficiently large. Anyway, uh, to summarize, this is a model that you know addresses the question of why do banks exist. So proposes one uh, one mechanism that that can explain uh, that. Uh, so predicts the existence of financial intermediaries that are large and well diversified, that whose whose liabilities are debt liabilities, so debt contracts, deposits, just like banks, uh, with costly bankruptcy and have illiquid assets, illiquid loans, because you know these are loans that they monitor themselves. Nobody knows how, what, the, what they are worth. Uh, the paper has uh, generated many other papers you know, that, has, that have extended the model into various uh, directions and use these extensions to study, in particular, optimal uh, banks uh, regulation. And the last point I want to mention, I think it's a transition to the next uh, model, is that this role of banks as delegated monitors with illiquid loans uh, can, of course, contribute to explain why financial crisis, uh, defined as the a period in which many banks fail at the same time, are usually associated with deep and long recessions because you know, you, when banks fail, you uh, disrupt this relationship between the bank and the borrowers. The bank knew the borrowers had paid the monitoring cost to, you know, uh, to know them. Uh, if you, you cannot replace this relationship by a new relationship without any cost, uh, like that. Uh, do you have? I mean, if you don't have any, do you have questions? If if no, uh, I'm happy to. All right. Uh, so thanks. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to uh, talk today about this uh, this paper. So let's see where it works. Yes. Um, so this is the, the third paper, the third um, uh, economist that received a Nobel uh, Prize or the Prize in Economic Science in memory of Nobel. And um, and this is a, a paper that uh, kind of tackles really big questions, if you want. And uh, first of all, a historical question: Why the Great Depression was so deep? Why it lasted so long? But more generally, you can think of that as a question about financial crises. Why are they different? Uh, what is increasingly evidence uh, of the fact that financial crises are deeper for normal business cycle uh, recessions? And in fact, they last longer. They tend to have uh, a deeper uh, trough. Um, now, Bernanke's work is important, uh, not because we, you won't be impressed by how high tech it is, let's say that straight away, but it's important because it changed the way in which us as economists uh, would think about banks and the role they play in a financial crisis. So it's a bit of a seminal paper in the sense that it was a moment of transformation in the debate. Uh, and in fact, till that point, the finance literature had been dominated by papers that were essentially taking very seriously the efficient market uh, paradigm. And in that sort of framework, both the financial structure, but also importantly, the financial intermediation banks would be completely irrelevant. They would not matter to aggregated facts. So in a way, they were always an afterthought in the, in the macro analysis. Uh, now, what Bernanke paper in 1983 uh, did was to show that in fact, bank failures were not simply part of the fallout, if you want, of the endogenous transmission, the endogenous um, way in which a recession was happening, in particular the Great Depression, but instead they were at the core of the, the, the mechanism by which that uh, uh, depression, that recession turns into a very deep and prolonged uh, depression. And in doing that, you provide um, a bit of empirical analysis and quite a lot of narrative uh, analysis about 
uh, what was happening at the time. And the insight of that paper, in fact, is crucial, and that perhaps uh, answered the previous question that was made online, because helped shaping the response of the central banks many years after, uh, during the Great Recession, 2007, 2009, and possibly uh, was at the core of the policy response that made possible for a relatively shallow recession, at least as compared to the uh, Great uh, Depression. And that, in fact, was the time when uh, Bernanke was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, so perhaps not by chance. Uh, things went in a different way. Um, now, just to remind ourselves, uh, the Great Depression is by far the deepest and longest recession in the US, at least since we have systematic data. So since we start collecting data, that's the biggest recession we have and lasted for 10 years. There was also a global recession. And in fact, all across the world, uh, the stock market tanked. Uh, there was a collapse in, of the international trade. There was a dramatic contraction in GDP and there was mass unemployment all around. Now, the chart you see here is from the, the document of the uh, Nobel Prize um, uh, Committee. And this gives you uh, the, the, the trough uh, in the GDP contraction for different countries. And you can see the sheer magnitude of these uh, contractions. They go up to 40% uh, for some, some countries. Uh, so huge events uh, in the history of uh, the uh, economy, modern economy, if you want. Now, if you think about US, what is the timeline? Because it's going to be important for the discussion uh, later. Now, the recession started in 1929 with uh, the US stock market crash. And at that point, it looked a lot like, like the 1920-22 uh, recession, which had experienced a very quick recovery. So there seemed to be not much uh, to worry about. However, in 1930, there was what is, was called a change of character of the contraction by Friedman and Schwartz in the book, because that was the point where a banking crisis uh, started. Now, we have to think of the fact that at the time in the US, uh, bank runs were fairly common. The system was very fragmented, lots of uh, small banks, and there was no, uh, if you want, guarantee for that. However, historically, they've been contained and were contained with the suspension from activity, and that was essentially uh, enacted by almost informal organization of banks called clearing houses. Now, there is some evidence, and uh, uh, Bernanke discusses that in, uh, in, in, uh, in the paper, that the creation of the Fed in 1913 uh, upset the equilibrium because all of a sudden, for some reason, uh, actors in, the, in that arrangement thought that the Fed had a role in uh, preventing a uh, crisis, even though the Fed didn't um, sort of have uh, any, any tool, if you want, in the police toolkit at that time. So what happens in between 1930 and 1933 is, is an un unprecedented economic downturn. The market lost about 90% of value. There was a huge contraction in credit. At the end of 1933, only half of the banks had survived. And there was a dramatic reduction in production. GDP contracted 32% and industrial output contracted 46%, huge numbers. And mass unemployment of 25%. Now the financial panic ended, and that's the point in which there's a, um, there's a turning point in this history, in March 1933, when the government of uh, uh, Roosevelt declared a national bank uh, banking holiday. So all banks would close for a week. And later that year, the Congress starts approving a, a number of measures that are under the uh, title of National Banking Acts. Amongst those, of course, the Federal Deposit Insurance, to which all of us are fairly uh, accustomed uh, today. From that point on, starts a very slow recovery of the economy. Uh, albeit in 1937, something happens and there is a recession in depression, so a new uh, event. Now, if you look at the chart uh, of US economy between 1913 and 2020, uh, you see that there's this upward trajectory uh, we know well, but you also see that there are bars. These are the, the, the recessions between the start of recession and the trough. And you see that the recession starting in 29 as the largest, if you want, the blockier uh, bars. And there's another bar coming later, it is in 1937. Now, the, the very moment in which the US economy goes back, if you want, to the trend is when the war starts in 1940, essentially. 
for a huge, huge event. And you can also see, however, the, the, the great financial crisis is the one from the last uh, up here. And you see the COVID. Now, this looks quite big, if you want, as compared to this event here. However, uh, that is a little bit a, a misreading on the chart, because if we take log levels, now we see how big was the recession compared to the level of the economy, because this will give us a century percentage uh, uh, changes. And you see how huge is this event here, the, the, the Great Depression. And how small, in fact, looks uh, the, the, uh, the Great Recession. And that is more COVID. All right, so what was the, the, the reason why that uh, event was so uh, bad, if you want, so deep and protracted. Now, the dominant, expan the dominant explanation at the time of this paper uh, was coming from uh, Friedman and Schwartz, and the idea was that the waves of banking crisis had reduced the money supply, and therefore the money multiplier, and the failure of the Fed to offset this decline essentially had created a huge money supply crunch, and that had created deflation and contraction of economic activity. Now, if you, if you think of this explanation as a problem, and the problem is that that requires very long uh, money on neutrality. You need to have some very long term, some uh, in, in uh, uh, non neutrality. And that was stickiness, some information friction, something like that. Now, the 1993 proposed a new explanation that, in his words, was complementary uh, to the old ones. And the idea was that financial intermediation is crucial in order to connect lenders to borrowers. And banks' failures in 1930-33 had hampered and impaired the financial sector, and that had resulted into an increase of the cost of intermediation. Now, this in increase of cost of intermediation had a direct effect because now borrowers, and in particular smaller borrowers, like household firm farmers and small business, had access to the credit that was either impossible or very costly. And that was the first effect. And there was a second effect because this in turn had uh, given essentially a very uh, prolonged negative effect on, on uh, aggregate demand and create the, created um, deflation and uh, debt overhang. Now, much of the analysis of Bernanke comes from this data that have been just replotted. There's a table. In the, in, in the paper. And what you see here is on two different axes. So you see on the, on the uh, left axis, you see first of all, the dark blue line is industrial production. And that's normalized to one at the beginning of the crisis. And you see it collapsed of around um, 40%, a bit more. That's the dark blue line. And then there is uh, a number of bars. And the red bars tell you the million of dollars, the amount of deposits to the uh, banks are uh, failing. The green line is instead is the, the amount of new loans in, over the personal income of the uh, US population. Now, what the first observation that Nanke uh, uh, makes is that if you look at the beginning of the crisis, there's a first a sharp drop of uh, loan over uh, personal income, but that then recovers. And then, and that is a but it comes along with a very sharp decline of industrial production. So the observation he makes is, you know, nothing is really happening apart from a bit of cleansing initially in the, in the financial system. When things start to go really bad is when you have these mass waves of failure of banks. And that, in fact, if you look at the spikes of the, the, the failure of the banks, they come along with huge contractions in percentage, in percentage terms of the new loans over a personal uh, income. So there's a mechanism there, that's the observation, that does not come straight from the contraction in uh, GDP or in production to a contraction in loans, but comes really from the failure of banks. Uh, that's, that's the observation. And you see the last wave of uh, failing of banks, that's when the bank holiday is set, is so huge that I had to break the, the column in order to put it on, the, on a uh, readable uh, uh, scale. So that's the, the, the first observation. That comes with a lot of narrative in the paper. Actually, it's a very nice paper uh, to read, and I would uh, recommend having a look at it, uh, if you will. 
Now, the reading of Bernanke is that, first of all, there are no monetary effects that come through cost of credit. And it starts from the observation that self-fulfilling panic is a likely explanation for the surge in bank failures. And, that, and when he does that, he cites the, the paper of Diamond and uh, Dibbling in the working paper version. Now, financial panic, he, he argues, impaired the ability of financial intermediator, in, intermediaries to supply credit to firms, farms, and households because they were disappearing. And with them was disappearing, uh, if you want, the capital in terms of uh, uh, skills and screening, long-term relationship, and all of that. That essentially created a spike when an increase in the cost of credit intermediation, what we call CCI. And that increase in the cost of credit intermediations implied that credit now was very expensive to small borrowers, small firms, uh, and that was not available uh, for uh, some uh, potential borrowers. Now, how big were these effects? Well, there's no proxy for CCI, but we can look, and that's what we propose to do, at the spread between BAA corporate bonds and treasury bonds. Now, this is a measure that we still use in some form uh, today uh, that is a good indicator of risk attitude, if you want, of the lenders, how risk adverse are uh, uh, lenders. And therefore, can be thought of as a proxy for how difficult it is for risky borrowers to obtain funds. Now, what you can see here is that the spread goes from 2.5% to 8% at the height of the crisis, and then it starts declining. So there was a huge, if you want, contraction uh, in risk attitude or a huge increase in risk aversion. However, there's still to be, in a way, argued or proved, uh, if, you, if you want, uh, that these non-monetary effects also affect output. Now, in doing that, the Nanki uh, uses an argument that, that was made by Fisher in 1933, that was popular among policymakers, but was not very convincing to people in academia. Um, and the argument was that that deflation, uh, that the, 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 um, the, the, um, the contraction in uh, uh, credit was creating a, demand, a contraction in demand, a contraction in demand was creating that deflation that was sort of setting up a feedback uh, loop. Now, the counter argument to that is that if there's a redistribution from borrowers to lenders, then there should be no macro effects. Now, the main point of Bernanke was that actually that point was valid because there was a huge heterogeneity, heterogeneity in leverage, and that was, was creating a macro effects. And in fact, he was providing a lot of narrative on the fact that that deflation disproportionately hit small and bank dependent borrowers that could not finance themselves on the market, perhaps. And those were exactly the profiles that had significantly increased their leverage before the crisis. And therefore, to them, the deflationary pressure was very significant. And the contraction in demand dampened the economic activity and was creating a deflationary pressure. And that was creating a feedback loop, because then the protracted fall in prices and money income was increasing the debt burden in real terms. And that was eroding collaterals, further contracting the economy. So that's the, 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 the core of the, the intuition of this, of this paper. And then it provides some empirical evidence. Now, to, to be honest, and to be honest with PhD students, do not expect to submit the paper with this empirical evidence today and win a Nobel Prize. Probably not, I would say. Um, so, so I would expect, you know, probably they will send you a rejection of the paper, print the paper and throw it out of the window, and maybe they will come and knock at your door. <laughs> but here the big idea matters. Let's look at that. So what he did was to look at essentially some predictive regression, if you want, of industrial production at monthly frequency on some measure of unexpected changes to money and prices. So the first part of the regression, the exercise was the black uh, part, where you regress industrial production onto its lags, plus a difference between the, the value of the prices or the money uh, stock, and what could have been predicted by using another regression, a first stage regression, onto economic activity. Now that would be 
Alabaro 1978 and measure the surprise or the shock, whatever was different in that uh, occasion. And then it compares that first regression with the same regression. It is augmented now with two measures of, of, of if you want, proxies of uh, uh, intermediation costs. And these are the, the delta of the bank deposits and the bank delta of bank liabilities that are the, the variables we're showing in the chart uh, before. What he finds is that if you only have the black sort of regressors, you can't explain much of the regression. You would not explain the path forward if you want in a simulation exercise. However, once you add these proxies uh, that start from like zero actually, then you have a lot more additional uh, explanation, explanatory power, and you can explain a lot more in the forward path in a simulation. So quite a, if you want, um, quite a bit of evidence uh, in some form. Um, now, another sort of important observation here is that Bernanke was making the case that differently from pure monetary effects that require a, a large degree of non-neutrality, for example, due to sticky prices, wages, stick information, you name it. So in the case in which we consider a credit channel, we can have quite naturally persistent effects because the duration of these effects would depend on how much time it will take in order to rebuild, if you want, the long-term relationship between banks and uh, borrowers to reobtain the, the information to screen people and so on and so forth. So it can be a very lengthy process. And in fact, it was providing evidence that the contractions on credit supply didn't end in 1933 with the bank holiday, but last much, much uh, longer. Uh, and in fact, he claimed that the recovery would have been much slower without many of the government's interventions in the credit market. Uh, now, if you want to connect that with uh, the presentation we had before, uh, Bernanke's work can be seen as essentially evidence supporting Diamond Dibbig's models. And in fact, uh, first of all, Bernanke provided evidence on the fact that bank runs can lead to financial crisis. That would be the mechanism uh, of the model of Diamond and Dibrig 1983. And then that bank failure disrupts the screening and monitoring services of the banks and that could lead to prolonged impairment of the credit intermediation, as in the model uh, we saw a second of Diamond 1984. Now, let me uh, conclude here. So, first of all, the key idea of this paper is that financial intermediaries play a crucial role during financial crisis in general, but especially in financial crisis. And in fact, there's a huge literature, I can't uh, go through it uh, today, on macrofinancial interactions. Some important papers are here. There's the Nankin Gaffler that essentially takes the intuition of this paper and creates a general equilibrium model with financial frictions. And then Bernanke, Gaffler, and Gilchrist, 99, the first G model with the financial accelerator and nominal rigidities and that allows to study financial monetary interaction, the attack and more that provides a, a neat way to understand amplification of the asset prices and collaterals, but many, many more, especially uh, studying the great financial uh, uh, crisis. However, the big legacy of this uh, line of research of these papers we saw today is the, the policy response uh, during the great financial crisis across the world. Because what happened was that there was panic in the short term debt market, following uh, the Lehman Brother collapse. And on that occasion, while of course Bernanke was chairman, the Fed acted immediately as a lender, a lender last resort uh, for both commercial, but also for shadow banks. So they were targeting the entire, if you want to create uh, market. And there were a series of programs that were essentially looking at different financial intermediation function, trying to plug in liquidity in those uh, spaces. There was a huge, uh, large, of course. Right, so that was uh, one of the popular critique. Yeah, so the, the, the question was, was, uh, was about if they really believed, if uh, Bernanke really believed to, the, to, the, to this mechanism, why he let uh, Lehman Brothers uh, collapse. Uh, it was, it was. 
so that's that's debated also in newspapers there was quite a bit in the in the blogs on that um, um i think we can sort of discuss of the implication for at that point the fed didn't have yet clear mandate to intervene uh, but what matters is that what happened next was very much by the books of these uh, of these articles and by the literature scientific literature Yeah, so that's a potential uh, sort of reading that they thought was possible to contain, or they thought that was was less systemic that, that's what than, than we realized it was. And then all of a sudden it was a realization of, you know, many assets they execute in the system and you know, the systemic implication of this failure. And then immediately uh, the Fed went into crisis mode and uh, sort of plugged out all of the tricks that were coming from this, and the intuition that was coming from this uh, literature. And the same was, uh, was happening with the Treasury. Um, and the same was happening, in fact, in your area or in, uh, in the UK. Um, so clearly, this is a literature that has a huge real world uh, insight, implication, and, uh, and that we saw in, in action. And that perhaps explains why uh, 40 years later, as the question was asking, um, and Nobel Prize is given to these uh, uh, three columns. And that's it.